everybody, it's Danielle Benden and Ernie Bozhart, your neighborhood archaeologists from Driftless Pathways. Um, we have had the privilege of giving tours to NRF members for the last few years. We're sorry we can't be with you in person this year, but we thought we would bring you this week's virtual field trip to Silver Mound. And Ernie's going to tell you a little bit about Silver Mound. So Silver Mound is Wisconsin's oldest and largest archaeological site. Uh, it's a place where uh, there's a stone called Hickston Silicified Sandstone that Native Americans went to 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 collect and mine to uh, use the stone to chip uh, into spears and arrowheads and hide scrapers and knives and all sorts of functional tools. Um, and uh, the process to do that is called flint napping, which I'll show you in a little while. We are going to give you a little bit more information and then we'll hit the trail. See you soon. Hello everybody. Before we hit the trail, we thought we'd just give you a little bit of background about Silver Mound. Um, Silver Mound is a 500 million year old Cambrian age sandstone hill that you see there in the picture. It's located in Jackson County, just on the outer edge of the Driftless area. It is Wisconsin's oldest and largest archaeological site. Uh, it is a National Historic Landmark, and about 200 acres of it is owned by the Archaeological Conservancy, so that definitely adds to its protection. It is the sole source for a type of stone called Hickston Silicified Sandstone that Native Americans used for flaking a variety of tools. That process of, of making stone tools is called flint napping, and Ernie is going to demonstrate that for you actually before we go on the trail. But for as long as people have been in Wisconsin, some 13,000 years since the end of the last ice age, people have been coming to Silver Mound to mine for the best quality stone for making their stone tools. Stone tools. There are nearly 100 archaeological sites that have been identified on and around Silver Mound. And these include stone quarries, um, lithic or stone tool workshops, open air campsites, and rock shelters. And we're going to show you some of those um, later today. Hickson Solicified Sandstone comes in a variety of colors, as you can see by the photo. Um, it can be white or honey colored, it can be red and orange, sometimes it can be even like a darker purple color. It's semi-translucent stone, sometimes referred to as sugar quartz because of its fine grain texture. Perhaps the most remarkable part about Silver Mound are the prehistoric mining pits. When white settlers arrived in the area, they saw hundreds of these quarry pits and assumed that people were prospecting for silver or some other precious metal, hence the name Silver Mound. But in fact, these were prehistoric pits dug by Native Americans starting 13,000 years ago. And essentially, Silver Mound, was the, Silver Mound was the prehistoric hardware store. This is where people came to retool, to get stone to make a variety of tools to essentially stay alive. Um, you can't hunt without good tools. And so this is an incredibly important place in the world for native people that they would return to annually um, up until the, when the French get here in the 1600s. People are still returning to Silver Mount for this stone. Some of these quarry pits, which you can see in the photograph on the right, are massive. I've also highlighted a couple of them in red. But just to give you an idea of the scale of these, the largest ones are about 50 feet across, 20 feet deep, and people are digging with just simple digging sticks, trying to get below the freeze-thaw line to get the best quality stone. And what they would do are, is create a series of preforms or blanks that you can see here in the photograph. And then you could carry a series of preforms or blanks away uh, from Silver Mound so you would have a, some stock to make tools when you needed while you were away from Silver Mound. So maybe one preform can make several finished spear points, finished spear points, or hide scrapers. There are also a series of rock shelters and some rock art at Silver Mound, which we're going to show you on the trail. There are both pictographs, which are paintings, and petroglyphs, which are carvings. There's this is an example of a carving. I also outlined in white. Um, a couple of the, the carvings, I won't tell you what they are until we hit the trail, maybe you can make them out. Um, and then a couple of photographs of just a few of the rock shelters that are on Silver Mound. We are going to now show you a flint napping demonstration and then we'll get out on the trail. See you soon. 
So I'm going to demonstrate flint napping, the craft of flint napping, which is chipping stone to make stone tools, and you break stone in a controlled fashion. And the key to that is to have rock that is glass-like. How brittle that is. Um, and this is Hickston silicified sandstone that um, we collected from farmers' fields around Silver Mound. It's, it's not a good idea to take stone off of Silver Mound itself. Um, so what I'm going to show you is there's a three pr three step process to flint napping and I'll just demonstrate uh, the beginning of it which is to have a good piece of, of glass like stone, Hickston silicified sandstone and then the, to, to, to reduce the weight of this and thin it down and to test the quality I use a hammer stone. This is just a basalt river cobble or, or lakeshore cobble from Lake Superior um, and I'm going to I'm going to take this cobble, I'm going to balance the slab of, of Hickston in my, in my hand, protect my lap with that leather Take the, ha the hammer stone and I'm going to come down and I'm going to hit this and drive a flake off the bottom. So I have to actually read this shot, up the, the, the stone. I'm going to hit it here and take a flake off down here if I hit it right, at the right angle and with the right velocity. So here we go. A little flake, here we go. Here we go. That flake broke. Let me go again. So this is a flake that I just knocked off of that back side of that thing. That's where it came from. And where I hit it, you can see the little gray spot, that's called the striking platform. And underneath it, on the inside of the flake, there's a bump right here. It's called the bulb of percussion. And all flakes that people make have striking platforms and bulbs of percussion. And that's what we tell man-made or people-made uh, artifacts from uh, natural fractured flint. Um, so. What I can, that, so what I do is I can go around and I can chip this all the way around and I can get something that begins to look like this, like an oval shape that I st begin to thin down and test the quality. And I would, I would continue to do this and get this nice and thin. Then I could take that away from Silver Mound and use it as a stock tool uh, when I'm not at Silver Mound itself. Um, let me show you the next step is to take a flake like this. Well, let me just show you how sharp this is, first of all. These are like razor blades. So here's a piece of leather. And I had a piece that was going to take off here. And I'm just going to So you could skin an animal with just a flake, but the edge gets dull and so you have to, you want to resharpen that edge and get it get it nice and tough again, but just like just with that that flake like that you could you can make us a, a a knife. Um, the next step is to take that flake, excuse me one second, the next step is to take that flake and I can turn that into a hide scraper by using a deer antler, the bottom of the deer antler, we call it a baton, and I'm just going to take that sharp edge that I just used to, 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 uh, to cut that hide and I'm going to turn that into a 45 degree angle, like if you can envision the, uh, the ice scraper for your windshield in the car. 45 degree angle with a flat bottom. So I'm just going to take this and just knock, knock off smaller flakes. So the first step with the hammer stone, that's called hard hammer percussion. This is soft hammer percussion. And I'm making smaller flakes. Everything I knock off is a flake. And I've straightened that edge and when I flip it over, I don't know if you can see all the little nick marks there. But that is what I retouched, and that becomes a hide scraper to scrape the hair off the outside or the, the fatty tissue off the inside of the animal. So that's a tool that I just made, all right? Um, the final stage to make, let me give you an example here. Let me pour one out. To make a finished tool, something like this. This is a replica, but to, to finish this, the edges here, and to put the, the notches in to half this spear point onto a wooden shaft, um, you use the tip of a deer antler and you push off flakes, and it's called pressure flaking. And I'll just show you how to do that. I'll take that same flake I just had, um, and I have to protect my hand here, because I'm gonna push flakes off. I'm gonna hold this and the deer antler here, and I'm gonna take this tip here and I'll just knock off, I'm just gonna push off a series of flakes by pressure flaking, all right? Flip it over. You can see those little chips I just took off of there? Do the same thing the other way. 
tiny little pressure flakes. So you can see the flakes that just chimed off right here. If I get the sun angle right, you see that? Let me get up to the tip and then I'll put a notch in this just to show you what it's like to make it a, an arrowhead or a spear point or a knife. To, to, from start to finish takes about a half hour to an hour to make one. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you how to notch it. Now you can see that the pressure flakes that just took off right there on that side and on this side a little bit. So to notch this, if that were a finished arrowhead, you take the pressure flaker and I just push straight down. This is a thick part and I just push that U shape out. I flip it over, do that again. Yeah, it's pretty thick right there right now. But that's how you would notch essentially an arrowhead. And that's the basics of flint napping. So we're at the Dwyer Rock Shelter on Silver Mount and it's named after Harry Dwyer who carved his name in the top of the rock shelter uh, in 1919. It's faded now, but it says Harry Dwyer, uh, something, something 17th, 1919. So he was here, he was the former owner, but this is the largest rock shelter on Silver Mound. Uh, it consists of two chambers, the left one and the right one. And those chambers are there because the side walls of those are not cemented. It's a soft sandstone. So it allowed it to erode backward. The ceiling is in, in the column in the middle, the support column, um, are cemented sandstone. And the ceiling is all is blackened, you can see, from fires. Uh, and, uh, um, and the column, in, in many places, are, there's, there's battering marks and people flaking off the, the ceiling and in the, in the, in the, on the column there, too. The floor is a dirt floor. It, it uh, was excavated by UW Waukesha, Milwaukee in 1973 and UW Oshkosh in 1973. Um, and the dirt floor goes down about eight feet before you hit bedrock again. And it's stratified layers of soil and cultural debris. It contains millions of flakes, the chips for making stone tools. But there's also animal bone, pieces of pottery in the upper parts of it, and some stone tools and some arrowheads. At the very bottom, there's a roof fall that had come down and the archaeologists lifted that up and there was a there was a fire hearth underneath it and they got a radiocarbon date on that fire hearth it was 9,000 years old. So this is an exposure of the silicified sandstone on Silver Mound and it's about 10 feet thick um, and this is just a sandstone that became cemented. It's really hard. You can see within here, there's cross bedding from when this was just sandstone. It's 500 million years old Cambrian age sandstone that in places became cemented. So it's glass-like um, and, and it's good for making stone tools. You can literally wiggle out sheets here to make stone tools, but, but these are exposed to freeze thaw and, uh, and there's faults in there. And so these are really actually not good for flint napping. Because of that, the Native Americans discovered that, that if you dig in to the talus below here, um, you can get stone that, is, that is, has eroded out, but it's not, exposed, it's not exposed to freeze thaw. Um, in this pocket, there's, a, there's an area right here that is all battered, and that's because this is an area where the, the, the cementation is really, really good, and it, it, it became what the flint never is called glass-like, or candy, and they call it the candy. And this stuff is like translucent. It's the best quality stuff, and you can see these battering marks all through here uh, because they tried, even though this is frost fracture, they tried to get this bubble out. So uh, this is the Geske Glyph Rock Shelter at Silver Mound, and it's a, it's a small rock shelter, much smaller than the Dwyer Rock Shelter. The back wall of this, the, sand, the sandstone is barely cemented. It's, it's poor quality uh, stone, um, and, and it's a smaller area. It's barely enough to get four or five people, and it's probably not a place that people would have lived. The ceiling is blackened by smoke, however, um, and then on the ceiling also there's some pictographs, some paintings, red paintings. Um, and, and I'll point those out. Um, this is one glyph here. There's a line here and coming off that line is five perpendicular lines. And then between this gap between these two, there's four red dots. And that's an abstract symbol. We don't know what it means. It could be a bird wing or antlers of some sort. And the four dots may represent something like the, the, the four directions or the, the, the winds 
uh, uh, four is a sacred number of many Native American societies. Above that, there's there's another red glyph, and these are these are legs here and a belly of an animal that's faded away. The head's gone. Uh, it's like a running animal. And then here is another one. Here's hind legs coming up in the back and then the rump and the back coming in. This would be the belly here. And the front half of this animal has exfoliated away. It's fallen away. So it's a, it's a grouping of three red pictographs made out of red ochre. Here we are at the Rainy Day Rock Shelter on Silver Mound. We're on the back side of Silver Mound now. So what we're looking at is a small little opening in the rock that at one time probably was much bigger. This looks like it's pretty filled in. Um, what this probably represents is an old quarry pit and actually I cleared off some of the leaves here and you can see back there, you can see a ring of sandstone that somebody has clearly battered. So at one time, this is probably a pretty big mining pit that was maybe twice the size um, that's just been filled in. But I wanted to point out a couple of, of glyphs here. So one of these is a turkey track and you can see the line coming down and the footprints coming out. Turkey tracks usually have three prongs. So you have the foot is, you know, sort of three. This one has four and if you look closely, this is actually the tail of a four-legged animal. So here's the head Here's the back and the tail that connects to that turkey track. Here's that little guy's hind leg and then his front leg. So that's really, really cool. Um, and then there's just some other pretty common symbols that you see in rock art um, in here. Let me show you a couple of more. So here's another one, and this is a diamond shaped. You can see part of it is eroded up here, but you can see it comes down and there's a dot in the middle. That usually we call those vulva forms and they're usually associated with like fertility or rebirth. It's a very, very common motif. There's probably another one or the part of another one right here. You can see um, the V here, but it's eroded all the way here. So that's it for our field trip this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, until we can see you in person, stay well, enjoy the outdoors, and we hope you're all doing great. Take care, bye-bye.